I have to tell you, from the point of view of being the head of New America, the pleasure of being there rather than here and just listening and taking notes and tweeting madly uh, for the last two days has been fabulous, but I'm e equally happy uh, to be able to moderate this particular panel. Yesterday when I opened the, uh, my opening remarks, I said that the future of war is not just about how it will be fought, it will be about uh, whether it will be fought and why it will be fought, that we need to get beyond weapons. We need to be looking at these deeper forces. So I saw with some irony, of course, this panel is exactly how it will be fought, how will the uh, wars of the 21st century uh, be fought. And to uh, talk about that, we have Peter Singer, who is a senior fellow and strategist at New America and author of many books, um, Wired for War being one. He's got a novel coming out. I'll do a little uh, called Ghost Fleet uh, in, the, in the spring. Uh, one of the things New America likes to do is to mix up different kinds of media, and we've had many uh, events uh, focusing on science fiction and how science fiction informs uh, policy and gets us to think. So we're now moving into uh, fiction, not science fiction. Well, no, it's, would you call it a science fiction book? No. But we'll hit it. It's You'll hit it. Okay. <laughs> projection, maybe, potentially. All right. And uh, to then uh, David Kilcullen uh, in the center, uh, who's the chairman of Kairos Global Systems. Uh, more importantly, for our purposes, he is an Arizona State University senior fellow, of, uh, fellow in the Future of War Project, uh, also uh, the author of The Accidental Gorilla and the, the Urban Gorilla title. Out of, out of the Mountain. Out of the Mountains, which you can also see. Uh, and uh, to my immediate left, uh, Brad Allenby, who is the Lincoln Professor of Engineering and Ethics at Arizona State University. I love the fact that you can be a professor of, er of engineering and ethics, uh, and is an affiliated faculty member with the Center on the Future of War uh, at ASU. Uh, also, and we will be talking about uh, his books uh, on civilizational conflict, one just, co just coming out. So, Peter, I'm going to start with you. Uh, one of the things we did uh, before this conference was uh, to ping our Future of War network about what is it that we are overlooking today, as, most overlooking today, as we think about the future of war tomorrow. So I want to start with Peter to talk about some of the answers uh, to that question. Sure, great. So what we did is um, asked the network of folks that we've built, which is 20 plus uh, you know, everything from the Dave Cole Cullens and the Brads of the world to, I can see out in the audience, people with experience in Navy SEALs to lawyers to technologists. And hitting off of some of the themes that we've heard from before, we seem to consistently get wrong the future of war. So we asked this network that we have built, what is it that we get most wrong about the future of war? And it launched off the partnership that we have with Defense One. Uh, on the Future of War channel. And um, just as an aside, the uh, article, um, it went up yesterday and it went so viral that um, it was picked up on uh, Dig where it's actually outpacing the um, James Vanderbeek video remake of Power Rangers. Now, if that doesn't give you street cred among a certain crowd, who knows it? Okay, so th the answers of what we get most wrong about the future of war from this diverse group of experts ranged from some of the things we've heard, um, misuse of history, a um, lack of flexibility in our strategy, uh, you spoke about the um, how adversaries are picking up lessons from what works and how they'll apply it in the future. Um, some of the others that were interesting to me as it links back to the discussion, for example, with General Odierno was um, proxies, how the future of war might be lots of proxy warfare. And that's something that frankly, we're not that good at as opposed to say the Russians who've made very effective use of proxy warfare. Although that's back to the future because that was Cold War, the that, Cold War world. That was, was, the, that was the argument. Um, another was, uh, and, uh, which is what the theme of my next book, um, what Ghost Fleet is about is a return to the unthinkable, which is major state warfare. What would happen if 
two major states, i.e. the US and China, really did go to war. And it's something that we have different attitudes um, in talking openly about or not. Um, it, it, you know, actually, there's a really fascinating quote from the um, chairman, uh, sorry, the chief of naval operations who said in, in discussing the potential of a US-China war, quote, if you talk about it openly, you cross the line and unnecessarily antagonize. By contrast, if you read, um, this is a quote from a, a Chinese two-star in the uh, regime's leading newspaper, quote, we must bear a third world war in mind when developing military forces. And so again, there's, there's all of these different things that we won't say we want to have happen, but we ought to be willing to discuss in the future of war. And so that's what the survey group responded. Great, thank you. So um, Dave, I wanna ask you about something you wrote, uh, wrote about uh, recently, where you described a Woolsian security environment. And I looked at that and I thought, I, have, I really don't know what that means. So I wanted to, it, it, but it, you were, um, you know, talking about that environment ending and then where we go. So explain to us what a Woolsian security environment means, why it's ending, and what is coming. So I should say that this, uh, <clears throat> this concept of a Woolsian security environment, I did actually run this by Jim Woolsey over dinner, and he agreed that it's okay for me to use the term. Um, about 22 years ago, about, you know, a mile up the road, uh, Jim Woolsey, who was uh, President Clinton's first CIA director, in his um, confirmation hearing, was asked about you know what 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 do you see as the, as the future challenges of the 90s you know about to to come up on the United States and he said talking about the Soviet Union, we've slain a large dragon, but now we find ourselves in a jungle filled with a bewildering variety of poisonous snakes, and in many ways the dragon was easy to keep track of. So for 20 years after that, from 1993 until I would argue the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, we lived in what I characterize as a, a Woolsian security environment where we didn't worry about the dragons, we worried about the snakes. So peacekeeping, counterinsurgency, counter-narcotics, counter-terrorism, counter-piracy, or the counter- The transnational, in my yeah. world of IR, that was transnational security right. as opposed to geopolitics. Right, and there are still people out there who are describing these as non-traditional or new security threats. They're not anymore, the dragons are back. And the reason that they're back is because of the invasion of Iraq in March of 2003. And in going into Iraq, and I believe the technical strate strategic term is cocking it up so badly, um, what we did was to telegraph to all potential adversaries not only the limits of our capability, but exactly how to challenge us in those capabilities. And so if you look at what the Russians are doing in Ukraine, uh, some of the an uh, anti-access and area denial things that the Chinese are doing, if you look at the way the Iranians have adapted, if you look at how ISIS has built on lessons from Al Qaeda, um, and how today's Taliban, which is dramatically different from preceding generations of Taliban, have built on what those adversaries have, have learned. Um, people have essentially watched what's happened over the last uh, you know, 12 years or so since the invasion of Iraq and radically altered the way that they're operating. So today we deal with both snakes and dragons in many of the same places and at the same time. And uh, they're different dragons from before. They've actually learned a lot by watching what we've gotten wrong over the last 15 years. So when you say different dragons, meaning different states that we need to be worrying about? I mean, they operate in a different way. I'll give you one example. There's a, there's a unit running around uh, Ukraine right now called the Vostok Battalion, which is named after a television station in Chechnya. And the reason it's named after that is because the brothers who owned that television station put their tribal allies at the disposal of Russian intelligence during the Second Chechen War and they turned them into something looking a little bit like a much more violent version of the awakening in Iraq. And now the Russians are employing them as a kind of uh, unconventional warfare tool on the other side of, 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 of their territory against a completely different set of adversaries. It's like we took the guys from Ambar and started running them all over the world as sort of mercenaries that, for hire. Um, and the personnel has changed over, the techniques have changed over, but the, some of the intent is still the same. Another example that I, I know Peter will probably want to talk about is the rise of cyber irregulars. You know, so just before the invasion of Georgia in 2008, the Russians got together a bunch of hackers and essentially gave them a choice of going to jail or working for the Russians in the upcoming invasion of Georgia. And what we saw was the ability to leverage non-state, in some cases criminal actors, to do much more than just screw with other people's information. And until recently, that was the worst thing you could do to somebody with a cyber attack. 
with the emerging Internet of Things, you can now have a physical kinetic effect with just cyber operations. Uh, and I think that's where we're starting to see some of this stuff go. So same actors, but they've learned from what non-state armed groups. So I also don't like the term non-state actors. You know, CNN is a non-state actor. You know, non-state armed groups. What those groups have been doing has now sort of bled over into the techniques that are being used. It's interesting. One, I remember someone saying that a non-state actor is like talking about a horseless carriage, that, which is what we used to call cars, right? You, all you, you're looking backwards. You're saying what it's not. We surely are at a point where we can actually find, find an, uh, a name. So I, I'm, I'm interested in light of the earlier panel, uh, certainly what you're saying is a lot of our adversaries think they can learn from history. Specifically, they think they can learn from our history. Uh, and if you put together what Pete said and what you're saying, you're, say, you're seeing the, the snakes and the dragons, much more complex environment. That's one of the themes of this entire conference is the complexity uh, of, the, of the threat environment. Um, Professor Allenby, you uh, have taken that idea up one, up one more level. Uh, in Popular Science, you have an article coming out uh, that talks about civilizational conflict. Now, I saw that and I thought, yeah, I've thought a lot about this actually recently. Sam Huntington, who is no longer with us, of course, wrote Clash of Civilizations back in the mid 90s, right? It was, it was one of the, it was in foreign affairs, I think in 1995, and it triggered all sorts of debate. And of course, he then published the book. Uh, but I've been thinking about that of, of late. Is that what you mean by civilizational conflict? Well, it's part of it. I mean, certainly, if you read his analysis, it's, it's still a good cogent analysis. I think you've got, you've got snakes, dragons, and then you've got an additional level. So <clears throat> one of the ways that, that it's interesting listening to the talks that it seems to break down is you start off most people, because we have a lot of military people, because we are talking about uh, war, most people are inherently continually bringing this back to the state, the, the Westphalian model, if you will, of, of, of war. And that's appropriate, because that kind of violence is still going to be very much with us. What some people are, are calling the next level of violence, the snakes, is neo-medievalism. That is to say that what you've got is a polycentric uh, pattern of order, violence, uh, and fragility that is playing most obviously right now across um, uh, Africa, Somalia is, is an obvious example, uh, but also playing in places like Ukraine where it has been militarized. So you have a very different pattern of violence uh, beginning to develop in this, this neo-medieval stage. Then above that, I think you have civilizational conflict. If you read uh, some, of the, um, some of the work from the uh, PLA, uh, what you see is that they're talking about virtually everything a society does as a weaponized effort to obtain advantage over another society. We heard some different definitions of strategy earlier. One obvious definition is getting people to do what you want them to do. And if you take that definition, and if you look at the way the Chinese are approaching it at this point, what you begin to see is that you've got conflict not at the traditional level of war. We shouldn't be talking about the future of war. We should be talking about the future of conflict. Because we understand war to the extent we understand it, a lot better than we understand conflict. And if we push conflict to the level of civilizational conflict, which is where it's going, we don't understand it very well at all. So the, the question uh, earlier about what would you do if you were asked to take Mosul was a very good question, because that's a military question the way we like to ask it. What we really need to be asking ourselves is, 50 years from now, what will you have done to ensure that taking Mosul mattered? That you, in fact, achieved not just the tactical goals, which we know how to think about, but the much broader civilizational goals, which we are, frankly, pretty bad at. And so my argument is that the way we're conceptualizing and framing this is important, 
But the step we're not taking is understanding that that is only a limited step forward and that the challenge before us is far broader, far deeper, and far more fundamental. And we're not doing it. So why call it conflict? I mean, what I'm hearing when you say, you know, different elements of society, why isn't that competition? I mean, you look at China and we're, we're partners in many ways. In fact, we're going to have to partner with China on a lot of global issues. And we're competing. We're competing hard. But why is that? Why, why, are, why is it necessarily conflict rather than competition? Well, because I don't view conflict as necessarily being violent or even, or even being a zero-sum game. I think that conflict, competition, however you want to phrase it, is an arena we need to learn how to play in and play in effectively because it will flow down and affect those incidents of violence. If we do it right, in fact, I think conflict does not mean more war. Conflict means less. For example, take China and our fraught relationship with China, to, to be honest about the point. Um, if we manage China the way that the United States and Britain evolved, that could in fact be significantly beneficial for both of us. If we manage China the way Britain and Germany evolved, that could be seriously problematic. So one of the questions that that kind of analysis begins to raise is, what are the significant differences from a civilizational perspective? What made the difference in how those two events played out? And most importantly, how do we try to play those out with China? So Peter, this is perfectly back to you since uh, Ghost Fleet, you just said, Ghost Fleet talks about uh, great power war. I have to just say, I think I'm with the chief of naval operations. It makes me deeply uncomfortable to talk about great power war with China for, for a whole host of reasons. Um, on the other hand, I take the point that if you don't think about it, you can't think about how to prevent it. So I, I, I take that point. But how do you, so you might want to respond uh, to Professor Allenby, but you may also, uh, I. I'd like to hear how you describe a world of great power war with, at the same time, all these other threats where exactly we are cooperating with China on counterterrorism, on, on, on drug, drugs, on we hope to be uh, more on climate change. So how do you describe that world? Well, so the first is to, to pull back on all of this and you know, set it in the space of geopolitics like, like Dave and Brad have done. And so um, to paraphrase a, a foreign affairs article, the re-emergence of China onto the global stage is the most important international relations story of the 21st century. Um, but then they went on to say it's unclear whether that story will have a happy ending or not. And then they posed the question of um, if we are entering a brewing Cold War with a China and its junior partner, Russia, which doesn't yet realize it's the junior partner, will the difference is with the prior Cold War is that China is not just a military competitor, but is a true economic technologic competitor. And that's how they describe this as an even worse scenario was the phrasing in foreign affairs of their parallel to the Cold War. I, I would say, well, there's an even worse than that even worse scenario, which is that, guess what? Sometimes conflict can break, actually break out, that, that Cold Wars can turn hot. And they can turn hot for a variety of reasons, either deliberate or by accidental. And in both cases, it's, it's better to talk about it so that you avoid the accidents and or better position yourself for deterrence to prevent it. Um, so the, the project, I mean, it's funny for me to call it a, a novel because it's a novel with 500 footnotes. That is, um, every single technology, every single trend um, is footnoted to the real world version, whether it's you talk about a certain weapon system to in the novel, there's two characters who argue over whether a war with China would happen and one cites the examples of, you know, every time great powers have risen, after, you know, what is it, 12 out of 15 times, there's been a conflict between them and the status quo power. The other one argues back exactly as we've heard here, no, there's too much trade with them, we owe them too much money, um, and they have that argument, and, and they, then goes to the foreign affairs article where someone said that, or when a Chinese admiral talks about a certain island chain. No, here's the link to the NDO, um, the Chinese uh, academy where an actual Chinese admiral said that. So the idea is to uh, play out a, it, in our world we would call it scenario, and someone would pay you know, a consulting company a half million dollars to run the scenario in the war game. 
I just do it in the, in the space of a book. Um, but the quick thing to what will wars in the 21st century look like that's different, I would hit you know, five quick, quick points to get out of the US-China side of just major state war. One, and they'll be mixed between the things that we've heard here today. They'll have everything from robotic systems to urban guerrillas operating in the same conflict space. Um, two, they'll go after asymmetries. That's what adversaries have learned. The U.S. brings certain key advantages to the table, our global logistics and basing, and that includes our aircraft carriers to global ISR, communication networks, GPS, domination of space. A thinking adversary will go after those. Third, that means the difference of a major state war in the 21st century from what we've experienced is it'll be multi-domain contestation. That is, you'll see fights in the air, in space, in cyberspace, not just roadside bombing on the ground. And so, you know, we say, oh, Will that be different, though, than trying to control no, I'm the talking seas, about, you know, it, the air, and, and the ground? It's the difference between, um, uh, on cyber, someone hacking CENTCOM's Twitter feed and someone taking down GPS. In air, it's the difference between what's shot down more aircraft, actually the only aircraft that got shot down in Iraq, both 2.0 and 3.0, is our own air defense missiles and our own jamming. It's now someone with the capability to actually shoot down and you've got to think about that. Or at sea, we've been completely uncontested. What happens when you've got to mix these all together? So multi-domain, that's what defines a, a major state war. Fourth, real quickly, U.S. technology advantage. Essentially from Korea onwards, every time we've gone into a fight, we've had a generation ahead technology advantage. That's the inheritance that we were given. That's not going to be the inheritance that the soldiers of tomorrow bring into battle. Um, and then finally, it raises a really interesting question of um, the American home front, because it's gonna be things like cyber war and the like, the American home front will be involved in a major state war how will the different players react, whether it's defense industry that looks fundamentally different than it did back in World War II? Will it be able to produce in a major state war using our current system? To what does Silicon Valley do in an actual war? To what do groups like Anonymous, how do they play in a war? And that, that's what I want to, that's what the, the book plays with, these different ideas of uh, let's actually ask these questions rather than ignore them. So that's. There's lots to chew on, and I'm going to ask both of you to respond. Uh, it, you picked up two of the things we've heard uh, yesterday and today. Yesterday morning, Missy Cummings said point blank, you know, the Israelis are better at drone technology or autonomous weapons, and the Swiss are better at robotics, and agreed that, that the American technological advantage, certainly in the military, <laughs> Uh, and part of her point was that we have huge tech advantages, but they're in the private sector, uh, will no longer be there. And then we heard General Ogierno this morning talking about this multi-domain, multi-domain, multi-territory. So multi-territory in terms of physical territory, but multi-domain. Multi, uh, to me, that sounds absolutely terrifying. I mean, it's, it's all kinds of war in all kinds of places. I, one question, and I, I'm, Dave, I'm going to ask you to respond just generally uh, to what Peter laid out. But one question that I have is, can that then be modular? In other words, can it, the opposite of declaring war in 1914, could you have a great power skirmish in one domain and pull back, uh, knowing this is coming, rather than sort of, okay, now we're at war and it's all over the place involving everybody uh, in multiple domains. So Dave, well, and you've been on the ground in Syria with ISIS, so you've seen one kind of the war that we're fighting now from a very granular perspective. I've personally not been on the ground in Syria, although we, we've done some research there. Um, I would say, um, to answer your specific point, uh, the, there actually have been skirmishes across single domains. They're going on now between our great powers. But I, I want to um, step back to, to a, a book that I wrote um, two years ago, the, Out of the Mountains, which I think gives some of the explanatory background to what Peter's talking about. You know, we've, we're seeing four... Footnoted in the novel. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Very, the, you know, four big, big trends um, that are really shaping the environment in which this will take place, which haven't really been talked about over the last couple, couple of days, but just to, to bring them up. Population growth, urbanisation, littoralization, the tendency for things to cluster on coastlines, 
and the new trend, which is this massive explosion in electronic connectivity that's taken place in just the last decade or so. So to put it in perspective, it's Say those four again. Population growth, huh? urbanization, literalization, literalization, and connectivity. Okay. So it, it took all of human history until 1960, and I'm conscious that I'm practicing history without a license in a room full of historians, but it took all of human history to 1960 to get to a total population across the entire planet of three billion people. The latest UN projection is that we're gonna add the same number of people, three billion, just into coastal cities in the developing world okay. in the next generation, between now and 2050, right? So I think you could argue that whatever the other factors, that that will have some uh, impact on where wars are fought and therefore how they're fought. Um, because you know, wars happen where people live. Uh, and so when, when an, an overwhelming majority of the planet, it'll be about two thirds, live in coastal cities by the middle of the century, that's the type of environment that we're gonna see this happen in. And so I think because urban environments create a disaggregated battle space, right, so the biggest single battle that the US has been involved in since the beginning of the century was the second battle of Fallujah, Operation Phantom Fury, November 2004, 17,000 combatants, Jeez. 40 days, not one big battle of 17,000 people, thousands of little battles of three, four, five people. Right? That, it's a disaggregated battle space. Um, so we're looking at, I think, small teams in networks operating in swarms um, in that disaggregated battle space. Um, I think we're looking at, as Peter said, a lot of autonomous systems so that the level of individual lethality that one person can bring to bear is dramatically higher than it has been in the past. Um, and an important point for those of us that fought in Iraq and Afghanistan, we're moving away from an environment where you can secure something by occupation to an environment where you have to secure by interdiction. So as an example of that, FM324, the counterinsurgency manual, talks about a number of roughly 20 counterinsurgents per thousand population. That translates into one rifle company per 5,000 people. That could be one village in Afghanistan. It could be half of an apartment block in a city. You could put the entire US military into a mega city. The majority of people living in that city wouldn't even know we were there. So the ability to secure a place by densely occupying it, which is what we did in Baghdad, is not going to be there anymore. We're going to have to think about how to secure or protect or control by interdiction, which is exactly where So cyber, let me just make interdiction meaning preventing anybody from, any, others from getting in rather or, than... Yes, or as an example, um, ISIS has no possibility of capturing the city of Baghdad because of this issue of scale. They're not trying to do that. They're trying to cut off the roads in and out of Baghdad. They're trying to dominate the belts around the city. They're trying to control the city by interdiction. And what we need to be thinking about is how to prevent that. Right? Maybe if you're going into Mosul, the best idea is not to run a repeat of Fallujah 2004, Maybe it's to think about unconventional warfare strategies and taking down the city by, by interdiction. ISIS doesn't have enough people to both defend the city against an external threat and control the city from within. There are plenty of people running around Mosul that are opposed to ISIS with weapons ready to fight ISIS. But we're talking about tanks down the, you know, knocking down the main door. So we have to think about how to, how to break out of that paradigm. Final point is we're not gonna do FM324 style counterinsurgency again. Not because it didn't work, because it did work. We, tr we worked in Iraq, we tried to redo it in Afghanistan, didn't work as well because the enemy had learned. People have learned again, that we're not, it's not gonna work again. Um, and so we need to be thinking about a completely different set of ideas uh, as, we, as we go forward. So we're about to go to questions, so get your questions uh, ready. But Brad, so you, you raised neo-medievalism and I thought we really are back to the future because there was an article in 19, 96 in Foreign Affairs on neo-medievalism, right around the time Sam Huntington's article came out. But from that frame, when I hear interdiction, I hear siege. I hear modern siege uh, with different weapons. Uh, but you, so we're listening to, a mil to accounts of a military that's going to operate on the ground in distributed networks with small, flexible teams who are connected. You've written that the, the job of the military in the world you're imagining is managing transitions. So that sounds very different. <laughs> so let's, let's well, hear no, about it, that. It's, it's in addition to. Okay. And it's in addition to because, because if you're going to accomplish your mission, you have to do the tactics right. You have to do the operations right. So you have to do interdiction. What you have to understand, and which I think the military does understand, is that's not enough. Not in today's world. That's not going to keep those cities. 
What you need to do is you need to learn how to manage and control those cities through cultural norms as well, which is extremely difficult. Um, What's, what, what do you mean, managing a city through cultural norms? I mean, you have to have a cultural uh, structure that is attractive enough so that you can minimize the amount of attractiveness of other models. The reason ISIS is effective is in part because culturally they have picked a very small demographic and they have learned how to be extraordinarily effective at energizing that demographic. Young adolescent males who have weak identities or no identities because of the situation they find themselves in. We're not going to beat ISIS militarily. We will control ISIS militarily and we have to do that. But we're not going to beat them. Which means that wars of the future are not going to be the kind of um, Clausewitzian uh, or Jominian contests that we all know and love. They're going to be extraordinarily difficult uh, cultural challenges and social challenges and the military has to learn how to do that. So if you look at the short-term military uh, necessities. It's the kind of thing we've been talking about all day. But look at the longer term. One of the questions that the military has to be able to answer for itself and for our society, because nobody else is competent to answer it, is the question of how do you manage a transition towards a world that is significantly neo-medieval? How do you manage the rise of China knowing that you're going to have significant problems from uh, both the Chinese and the American publics, who are probably not understanding the necessity for that realignment. Interesting. So that, and, and the reason that the military needs to be involved is not because they're necessarily going to be great at it at first. I was going to say, you anticipated have, my next question, why the military, but okay. <laughs> well, the, the, the question then is, is um, so you would trust our political system, the way it's breaking down now? So, so the, it's, a, it's a challenge, and nobody is going to control the process. That's going to be very hard for the military. It's going to be very hard for everybody. But when you're dealing with these complex adaptive systems, the idea that you control it is simply wrong. Right. The idea is that you need to learn how to push it in the directions you want, and you need to do that effectively. And it needs to be part and parcel of your military tactics, your military strategies. So what you need is you need a Clausewitz that also understands that it is civilizational conflict that needs to be managed, not just the traditional military conflicts. Right. Well, I definitely think, uh, um, Joel, we're there in the center. Uh, I, I think this point about understanding that you can't control things is very important. It's very important as part of military education. It is very much at variance with the traditional idea of trying to control an environment either by occupation or in the battlefield. So, and it, it, it assumes an acceptance of uncertainty uh, that is uh, a, a big shift. So, Joel. I hear a lot of conversation about conflict. You should introduce yourself. I'm sorry, Joel Garrow with uh, the New America Foundation and with Arizona State University. Um, I hear a lot of talk about uh, complex systems, about uh, networks, especially cyber networks. Why don't we have a National Guard division or four in Silicon Valley? Um, aren't most of these problems the ones, if we're having civilizational warfare and if one of our tacit advantages is Silicon Valley, why don't we militarize it? Well, Peter. There's a oh. number of reasons and um, you know, we hosted in this very room on Monday a uh, similar conference looking at the field of cybersecurity and what was striking as played out and was covered in the media is the um, distance between Silicon Valley and the national security establishment all the more so in the post-Snowden era. Um, second, you have, so there's a, just put it bluntly, there's um, distance in terms of distrust, and um, there's a legacy effect of that, and including on what happens if we go to a real war. Second, the question of the model, is the National Guard model the most appropriate one for cyber security and cyber war? Um, that's what we've done. We've tried to take a new capability and put it into an old box. 
Um, I would argue that the Estonian model of their um, civil defense league is a better one because rather than it being someone saying, I'm willing to join the National Guard and Reserves and meet these physical requirements, get this rank, and be liable for call up to anything from Afghanistan to Haiti to a cyber conflict, the Estonian model is more like a militia model or a civil air patrol model where you're pulling in experts but not dropping them into a formal military organization. I would much prefer to have that model, who hates that model very much? Con DOD and contractors, because they're like, that's our space. Absolutely. Brad? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Um, the, the, the real reason is that, that DOD does not have a culture that would allow them in any way, shape, or form to manage a Silicon Valley operation. Uh, you know, some, somebody who's who's high on Coke, Skittles, and slinging code is, is not a good candidate for basic training. It just isn't. Um, so what you need is Somebody you tweet that. <laughs> <laughs> high on <laughs> Coke, Skittles, and slinging code. Keep going. <laughs> then I'll never be able to travel to Silicon Valley. Um, or maybe I'll be a keynote, who knows. Uh, so I think that what we need to do is we need to figure out how to engage Silicon Valley in the direction we want without undermining the values that make them Silicon Valley. Um, how do you engage Disney? How do you engage your financial structure? I mean, you can imagine the masters of the universe trying to work with, with uh, the code of military ethics. Well, never mind, I won't make a snarled comment. Um, so, so what you need to do is you need to figure out how to get this very complex, very culturally different mix to work together without impeding what makes them unique. In other words, how do you, this is gonna sound bad, I, I don't mean it this way, how do you militarize American soft power without destroying the very thing that makes the soft power powerful? So we have a lot of learning to do, and my concern is not that we don't cover things that we're covering in here. My concern is that we think by doing that, we've really addressed the big elephant in the room, which is the civilizational structure. Okay, I'm going to take a couple more questions together, and then I'm going to give you, so you all can choose, uh, and because we're, we're just about out of time. They're, they're in the back. Well, uh, this is one of the interesting uh, topics that discussed, but I think there is another topic that has to be discussed too, that how oh, I'm to... I'm sorry, introduce yourself. Okay, uh, I'm Intizar, and I am former uh, senior advisor for HIFI's Council in Afghanistan. Uh, there is one topic that we have to discuss this too, that how to avoid the future of war. Uh, nowadays in Afghanistan, the emergence of ISIS is uh, an imminent threat uh, that replacing Taliban and hopefully uh, Taliban will be reconciled, but there is possibility that it will be a big and huge threat for the Afghan government. My question is that how the fundamental approach should be implemented in Afghanistan to avoid the future emergence of a, such a war that will threaten Afghanistan in the, the international forces in Afghanistan? Okay, so one of you there, there was another. There, sir, in the uniform. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lieutenant J.G. Chris O'Keefe. I work, I'm a junior member at the Pentagon, so I'm in the very bottom row of the acquisition process and the personnel process. And where, I'm, where I struggle to meet the two worlds is I've done some work in the, in the startup realm and also in the military. And the current process we have in place are just iterations of a 30-year process. We're coming to the end of them, acquisition, personnel. I struggle to see how we are able to be agile enough to adapt to the rapidity of the threats you're discussing. But the only organizational change can really come internal, and it's a congressional military partnership. And I don't really have a good grasp on how to go about affecting that change. Could you elaborate on that? Great. Okay. Carl, Les. I'm sorry, right here. And I'll, Ian, I'll get, give you the last one. So we have Afghanistan and acquisitions. Those are the two questions on the table. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman. This Simple question. If you're gonna fight war, how do you constitute winning if you, if you have to fight a war, how, how do you define what's winning and what's losing? Ian, Ian, you get the last question.
Uh, Ian Wallace, New America. Um, just coming back to the responses to that last question, um, which were really about co-opting US soft power for, for war. The, the problem with that is some of the companies that we're talking about, some of the biggest American-based companies, business models depend on their perception of being transnational or supranational uh, companies. And I wonder how that dynamic shifts the, the future of war. Okay, so I'm, we're going to go down uh, Brad first in the opposite order that we started. Just to amplify Ian's question, if you'll remember after Snowden, when the U.S. government responded, oh, we only spy on foreigners, the response of Silicon Valley would be, you mean the majority of our customers, right? Because most of them have a larger market share outside the United States. So it's exactly <clears throat> that tension. They may be based in the United States, but they are global corporations. And the idea of being close to the US military is, is, is harming their business directly. So let's go. So we have uh, the, the big win. Uh, how do you define winning and losing? We have the question on, on the specifics from Afghanistan, on procurement, uh, and this last one. So I'll start with you. So most people, I think, uh, don't recognize that there's still a very high level of, of uh, mortality among Americans in Afghanistan. It's just among the contractors. The level to which uh, American military operations have been privatized uh, is talked about, among others, by Peter. Um, but is not necessarily fully appreciated. We've talked about very traditional things in, in most of this discussion. Transnationals don't have any homes, and if you create an environment where they feel that you're impacting their bottom line too strongly, they're going to leave. Part of managing in a neo-medieval world is knowing how far you can cooperate with transnationals and where their true loyalties lie. Uh, so I think it's a very significant issue. I don't think we thought much about it. We assume that, that there's uh, American companies and they're bound by state boundaries and, and that's the game. Uh, and that's not true at all. So the question is not just how do, you, how do you get them to work with you if you're the Department of Defense. The question is given the constraints they face and their opportunities elsewhere, how do you get them to work with you? Which is a far more subtle and difficult question. Um, on the um, on the question of how do you know if you're winning and losing, I think the answer is you don't. I think that what you have, um, Sean McFade had a, had a cute little phrase um, where he talked about uh, what you've got is durable disorder. Huh. And I think what you've got is a situation in most of the world, think about the difficult issues we talked about earlier, in most of the world is a situation where you don't have a Clausewitzian win. You don't have a victory beyond which you don't go. We could do that the first war in, in uh, Iraq. Uh, we can't do that anymore, not with the big ones we face. How do you ever know that you've beaten ISIS? You don't until your culture is demonstrably superior by the fact that it's accepted by most people and it undermines their model. Wow. A lot, durable disorder, the question, you know, Hayek might have said that was creative destruction. Dave. Well, you know, in the special operations community, the term that's used is, is persistent conflict, an era of persistent conflict. And I think that's a, that's a, a sort of almost a synonym for that. Um, one of the things that we see in our work in Latin America and Africa is what we call conflict entrepreneurs, people that are continuing to fight, not because they're looking for some object beyond the war, as Klaaswitz would have said it, but because the existence of the war gives them something they want. So they're fighting to preserve the conflict and continue it, not to end it on terms favorable to them. Um, to, I'm going to focus on Afghanistan um, really quickly. I think it's incredibly important and under-discussed now because people are sort of washing their hands of, uh, of the conflict. Um, firstly, to be a little bit flippant, if ISIS wants to take on the Taliban, ISIS is about to get crushed. And I think that's uh, something that I would love to see happen. Um, and you know, you've already, already seen Mullah Rauf get, get killed. You've seen a number of people uh, across Badakhshan and across the eastern side of Nangaha turn against ISIS. Uh, so if ISIS wants to bring it to the Taliban, I'm sure that um, they, will, they will lose. Um, and in fact, I would really like to see some of the tactics that the Taliban have turned on us be turned on, uh, on ISIS. Um, but the second point that I would make is a broader point, which I think is where you're getting to. In both Iraq and Afghanistan, we created partner militaries in our own image. Huh. That was a mistake, uh -huh. right? And to their great credit, the Iraqis have been able to move on from some of the bad things we taught them to do to figure out how to operate effectively. It's time for Afghanistan to do, do the same thing. I would like to see the ANSF, particularly ANA SOF, 
take a lot of the counterinsurgency stuff and the foreign internal defense stuff that they've been taught and rip it up and recreate it in their own image and say, let's forget what the Americans taught us. Well, let's not forget it. Let's take it to the next level. Let's apply a little Afghan ingenuity and a little better understanding of society and an understanding of what motivates people in Afghan society and create something that looks different. And only then will you be able to say what technologies and techniques and so on are best suited for Afghanistan going forward. It's clear to me that Afghanistan cannot win if it tries to recreate with its level of resources what 50 Western countries fail to do with all their combined resources. So there has to be a different set of um, techniques and the only people that can really answer what those techniques should be will be Afghans themselves. And I'm talking not about every Afghan, I'm talking about the blooded commanders that have a dozen years now of experience fighting these guys who have learned what works and what doesn't work in their own certain specific circumstances. And applying that, I think, is where we need to go next. What you're really talking about is frugal innovation applied to, to military tactics. Okay, we're, I'm being very bad. We're six minutes over. Uh, so, Peter, you have the last uh, word, but please do uh, address the acquisition question, because I think it's an important one, uh, the procurement uh, question. Absolutely. Go I'll, I'll go in inverse order. So, on Ian's question of uh, multinational corporations and the like, for the book, the research wasn't just citing the articles by, you know, I see a lot of the people in the room. It was also doing interviews of the people who would be players in such a war, and they range from interviews with U.S. Marines and fighter pilots to Chinese generals to Silicon Valley venture capitalists. And um, not to give away the book, but basically to this question, the scenes in it, one is in a Silicon Valley venture capital, how do you react in the space? Another is at the Walmart shareholder meeting, how do they as a multinational corporation play in this? And then another is in Moyoc, North Carolina, headquarters of the company formerly known as Blackwater. What role do PMCs play in a major state war? So I, I won't give away the book other than to note that. Second, who's winning or not? It's a lot like the reaction that I had um, in the panel of the lawyers talking about what's war or not. At the end of the day, um, Judge Potter Stewart put it best. <laughs> we know it when we see it. You know, for all the data, quant and the like, we know when we're winning or not doing well. Um, acquisitions. Uh, the big fundamental problem I would put out there for the U.S. as we move forward is to learn from history, and I'll misuse examples and just put it this way. Um, what are we building today that is the equivalent of the Gloucester Gladiator that was the best last biplane? It had another nickname if you were actually forced to fly it in World War II, it was called the Flying Coffin. Or for the Navy example, what are we building today that is the modern day equivalent of the USS North Dakota, the last American pre-dreadnought battleship that actually we constructed after the dreadnought already hit the waves. So it came out already obsolete. What are we doing today that's along those lines? And then finally to the ISIS um, in Afghanistan question, I'll take a different, I think our strategic challenge towards ISIS is to distinguish between what our actions organized by them, a la how bin Laden and al-Qaeda definitively organized the 9-11 attacks from Afghanistan, top-down, selected members, funded and alike. What is organized by ISIS versus what is just inspired by the ISIS brand? And so there's a lot of things, whether it's a Sydney coffee shop or Europe or some of the things in Afghanistan that I would put in the inspired by brand category versus organized. And those lead to very different reactions, and I worry we're making certain miscalculations by um, combining the two as if they're the same. Thank you. So join me in thanking a panel that has given plenty to chew on. Thank you.